President Biden signed into law the bipartisan Safer Communities Act to help keep guns out of the hands of criminals. Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but they don't care. There are some things, inalienable rights, that you cannot justly take away from a free and equal human being. To rush out a gun control measure that will do nothing to save lives. Supreme Court emergency petition for rifle ban. There's this whole showdown brewing over a state's rifle and mag ban, and things just got a whole lot more intense with this recent move to the Supreme Court. You've got this emergency petition that's been fired off, asking for a quick and urgent halt to this ban until the big wig judges sit down for a conference on January 5th. It's like someone hit the panic button in the legal world. So here's the deal. This petition is like the legal equivalent of waving a red flag, screaming, hold up, we need a timeout here. They're basically asking the Supreme Court to step in ASAP and put a temporary pause on this ban while they figure things out. And they're playing the urgency card because this ban involves rifles and standard capacity mags, and there's a ticking time explosive attached to it, that January 1st deadline. Imagine this looming deadline like a sword hanging over everyone's head. If this ban isn't put on pause, there's this registration deadline that kicks in, making it a race against time. The Second Amendment gives Americans the right to own guns, but no right is unconditional or unlimited. It is a defensive weapon. It is a tool to allow me to protect my property. Assault weapons were rarely used in gun crimes, even before the ban. That's the Department of Justice. There are some things, inalienable rights, that you cannot justly take away from a free and equal human being. What's got people raising eyebrows is this one-sided aspect of it all. See, the state in question supposedly waived its right to oppose this emergency petition. It's like saying, we won't even put up a fight, which is a pretty bold move in legal circles. So the petitioners are banking on this non-opposition to swing things heavily in their favor. It's like they're saying, well, if they're not going to argue against us, the Supreme Court should just nod and grant us this emergency relief, right? This whole situation feels like a high-stakes game. You've got this urgent plea, a ban on rifles and mags, and a crucial deadline playing tug-of-war, all while the Supreme Court's conference date is fast approaching. It's legal drama at its finest, and everyone's holding their breath to see what the big justices will do. Will they hit pause on this ban or let it ride until the conference? Guess we'll just have to wait and see how this legal roller coaster unfolds. So let's dive into the legal battleground known as Culkin versus Pritzker. This case is like a heavyweight fight, taking on Illinois' Protect Illinois Communities Act, and man, is it causing some waves in the legal sea. You've got this act, PICA, which sounds all noble and protective, but it's got these regulations that are like a thorn in the side for gun rights advocates. It's all about restrictions, particularly on rifles, mags, and this whole registration jazz. Now cue the challengers, the folks behind Culkin versus Pritzker, they're basically saying, hold up, Illinois, these restrictions you're slapping on our rifles and mags, not cool. So what's got everyone's legal antennas up is this head-on challenge to Pika. It's like they've drawn a line in the sand saying, we're taking this to court because these restrictions, they're stepping on our Second Amendment rights. And when we say restrictions, we're talking about limitations on what kind of rifles you can have, the capacity of mags, and this whole deal about registering firearms. It's like a clash between state regulations and the fundamental rights folks believe are protected by the good old Second Amendment. The right of the citizens to keep and bear arms has justly been considered as the palladium of the liberties of a republic. To rush out a gun control measure that will do nothing to save lives. They say they just want to regulate guns. They don't. They want to abolish guns. The stakes are high and the legal ring is set. On one side, you've got the state backing PICA, claiming it's all about public safety and keeping communities secure. On the other, you've got these challengers waving the flag for individual rights, shouting, hey, these restrictions are crossing a line. So this case isn't just about rifles and mags. It's about the very heart of what people believe their rights should be when it comes to owning firearms. And in the legal world, this case is stirring up some serious debate and attention. You can bet everyone's watching to see how this battle unfolds in the courtrooms. Okay, let's talk about this ticking time explosive of a deadline, January 1, 2024. 
That date might seem like just another day, but in the context of this legal showdown, it's the kind of deadline that's got everyone on edge. This whole legal drama is tangled up in this looming registration deadline. It's like a countdown clock, and when it hits January 1, 2024, it's game over for those rifles and mags affected by this ban. The folks behind all this legal hustle and bustle are in a race against time because this ban comes with this you gotta register by this date or else tagline. Imagine it like this. You've got these rifles and mags that might become off limits or heavily restricted if they aren't registered in time. And with this case hanging in the balance, it's not just about legal arguments, it's about people's rights and possessions potentially being affected. As the American people are demanding change, and it is time for all of us to listen. The Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but they don't care. I mean, we've seen time and again, this is a separate issue, um, school shootings in this country plaguing us just as the drug epidemic is plaguing us. The urgency here is real. It's not just about lawyers and courts hashing things out. There are real life implications. Individuals who might find themselves on the wrong side of the law if this deadline passes and they haven't managed to get their firearms registered as per this law. So in a nutshell, January 1, 2024 isn't just a date, it's a make or break moment for those affected by this ban. It's the deadline that's turning up the heat, adding that extra urgency to this legal showdown and making every legal move feel like a sprint against time. One-sided request, Illinois' waiver impact. Strap in for a legal roller coaster because we're diving into the wild world of waivers and one-sided arguments in this whole rifle and mag ban showdown. Picture this scene in the legal arena. You got this emergency petition and it's got a twist that's making everyone raise their eyebrows. The plaintiffs, the ones pushing for this emergency injunction against the ban, are playing a Trump card. A waiver card to be precise. Now a waiver in legal lingo usually means giving up a right or saying, hey, we won't do this thing. And that's exactly what's causing this ruckus. The plaintiffs are claiming that Illinois, the state at the heart of this whole banned debacle, basically waved the white flag and said, we won't oppose this petition. Here's where it gets spicy. The plaintiffs are using this alleged waiver as a golden ticket. They're saying, hey, Illinois, you said you won't fight us on this. So the Supreme Court should just grant us this emergency relief without any opposition. It's basically an open and shut case, right? This one-sided argument is like a legal curveball. Normally, both sides go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, presenting arguments, counter-arguments, and swinging their legal swords back and forth. But here, it's like one side saying, we're in, but you're out, and hoping that the Supreme Court will nod along. It means you're more likely to be locked in your homes, deprived of your freedoms, less healthy, less safe. President Biden signed into law the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act to help keep guns out of the hands of criminals. I would acknowledge there may be Republican presidents who didn't do enough in the 80s to protect our gun rights. Today, they're coming for your guns. 24 million of them. It's a bold move, to say the least. The plaintiffs are banking on this waiver to tilt the scales heavily in their favor. It's like they're betting that because Illinois chose not to oppose their emergency petition, the court should just slide that injunction their way without even batting an eye. But hold your horses, because the legal world isn't always straightforward. Sure, a waiver might seem like a game changer, but courts can be unpredictable. Just because one side claims the others waived their rights doesn't mean the court automatically sways their way. There are layers of legal scrutiny and judges aren't always quick to jump on a one-sided bandwagon. This whole waiver impact angle adds this spicy flavor to the legal drama. It's got everyone watching closely to see how the Supreme Court reacts. Will they see it as a slam dunk for the plaintiffs, or will they pause and consider the implications of accepting an argument based on the absence of opposition? Campaign Contributions and State Supreme Court Decision All right, let's step into the murkier side of the legal world where campaign contributions and court decisions start mingling in a way that's got folks questioning the fairness of it all. Imagine this scenario. You've got judges, these esteemed figures in the state Supreme Court, making big decisions. But here's the kicker. During their election, these judges received hefty campaign contributions. And it wasn't just a few bucks. We're talking serious money 
from folks involved in the very cases they're presiding over. Now, that's where things start getting a bit dicey. These campaign contributions are like puzzle pieces in a bigger picture. They create this cloud of doubt around the fairness of the court's decisions. Because, you know, if someone's tossing bags of cash into a judge's campaign fund, the natural question is, does that affect their impartiality? And that's exactly what's been happening in this legal saga. Judges in the state Supreme Court, the ones dealing with this whole rifle and mag ban case, received these sizable contributions during their election. It's like a neon sign pointing at potential biases, raising concerns about whether these judges can truly be impartial when ruling on cases involving the same people who poured money into their campaigns. The thing is, it's not just about receiving money, it's about the optics. But this could potentially impact millions of Americans, law-abiding, Second Amendment-supporting Americans. In order to do this, Democrats in this body are willing to take away a citizen's God-given right, yes, God-given right. It's not the weapon. It's the soul of the person that's been injured by combat, and I have multiple combat tours. Uh, we want fewer deaths, and uh, it, uh, dangerous things can happen. When the judges ruling on a case are financially tied, directly or indirectly, to the parties involved, it casts this shadow of doubt on the court's fairness. Now, the challengers in this legal battle cried foul. They said, hey, these judges might not be playing fair because they've got these financial ties to the folks involved in our case. It's like questioning whether the playing field is level when the referees have a vested interest in the outcome. But here's where it gets even more tangled. The challengers tried to call out these potential biases by asking these judges to step aside from the case, to recuse themselves. They argued that these judges might not be able to give a fair shake because of these campaign contributions. But guess what? The judges themselves said, nah, we're good. We don't see a conflict of interest here. And that decision... That refusal to step aside raised even more eyebrows. It's like saying, we'll judge ourselves on whether we can be impartial, which, let's face it, sounds a bit fishy. So these campaign contributions have added this layer of doubt, this cloud of suspicion over the court's decision-making. It's got folks wondering if the scales of justice are truly balanced or if they've been nudged by the weight of these financial ties. In the legal world, where fairness and impartiality are the cornerstones, these kinds of questions cast a long shadow over the courtroom drama. Plaintiffs attempted disqualification of judges. Let's delve into a classic legal maneuver that didn't quite hit the mark. The plaintiffs attempt to disqualify judges from the case due to potential bias stemming from those controversial campaign contributions. Picture this legal chess match. The challengers in this rifle and mag ban case weren't exactly thrilled about the judges presiding over their fate. Getting assault weapons, AR-15s, um, out of the hands of, of people who shouldn't have them. Directly attack the issue at hand. And for me, it's very laser focused. It's violent crime in the metro. I think you need to have weapons to take on the government. You need F-15s and maybe some nuclear weapons. Why? Well, those judges had received quite the financial support during their election campaigns, from the very folks involved in this legal showdown. So naturally, the challengers smelled bias in the air. They're saying, hold up, these judges might not be able to play fair because they've got these financial ties to the people we're battling against in court. It's like questioning whether the referees can call the game fairly when they've got a stake in one of the teams. To level the playing field, the challengers tried to kick those judges off the case. They filed a motion waving the flag of potential bias and asking for these judges to step aside to recuse themselves from the proceedings. But here's the plot twist. It didn't quite work out the way the challengers hoped. The judges, the very ones being accused of potential bias, were like, nah, we're good, we don't see any conflict here. And they stuck to their seats, refusing to step away from the case. Now, that decision to deny the motion to disqualify themselves raised some eyebrows. It's like asking someone to judge their own fairness, which, let's be real, doesn't exactly inspire confidence in the fairness of the game. So despite the challengers waving the red flag and shouting, hey, there's potential bias here, the judges decided to stay put. Their refusal to step aside, even when challenged on potential conflicts of interest, added another layer of controversy to this already tangled legal web. The challengers' attempt to disqualify the judges was like trying to tip the scales back to what they believed was fairness. But in this legal drama, 
the judges held their ground, insisting they could be impartial despite those campaign contributions. It's like a plot twist in a courtroom drama where the accused judges decide their own fate, leaving everyone wondering if the scales of justice have tilted a little off-kilter. Emergency Relief Argument Let's unravel the plaintiff's plea for emergency relief in this legal tug-of-war over the rifle and mag ban. They're bringing out the big guns, arguing their case based on the public's interest and what they believe are some pretty solid reasons they'll win this legal battle. The plaintiffs are on a mission. They're waving this flag of urgency saying, hey folks, this isn't just about us, it's about what's best for everyone. They're painting this ban as something that affects not just them, but the broader public, emphasizing the broader implications of this legal tangle on everyone's rights and freedoms. But it's not just about waving the public interest flag, they're also playing the confidence card. They're saying, look, we've got a darn good chance of winning this thing on the merits. Our Second Amendment. It's a hell no to government trampling on our freedoms. Uh, we have the third highest gun-related injuries uh, in the country, 90% higher. Gun violence in this country is an epidemic, and it's an international embarrassment. They're confident that when it comes to the nitty-gritty legal arguments and the actual facts of the case, they're in the right. It's like a legal version of saying, we've got the evidence and we're ready to roll with it. And it's this combination, the urgency driven by the public interest and their confidence in winning based on the case's merits, that's fueling their plea for emergency relief. They're essentially saying, hey, we need this relief now because not only is it crucial for us, but it's also in everyone's best interest. Their argument hinges on the idea that if this ban isn't halted, there could be significant consequences not just for them, but for anyone affected by this law. They're aiming to highlight the potential harm and fallout if things don't go their way, emphasizing why the courts need to step in urgently to prevent any such harm. It's like they're playing the urgency card by shouting, Time's ticking and we need action! While also laying out this confident case for why they believe they're in the right. But in the legal arena, nothing's a surefire win until the judges bang that gavel. Sure, the plaintiffs are presenting a compelling argument, blending the urgency of the situation with their belief in the strength of their case. But in the end, it's up to the courts to weigh these arguments and decide whether emergency relief is warranted based on the broader public interest and the merits of the case. And in this high-stakes legal saga, every argument matters, but it's the judges who will have the final say urgency due to impending registration deadline. All right, let's zone in on the urgency pulsating through this legal saga because of that looming registration deadline. It's the heartbeat of this whole rifle and mag ban drama. Imagine this deadline, January 1, 2024, as this giant ticking clock in the background, counting down to a potential legal fallout. If you're in the shoes of those affected by this ban, this deadline isn't just a date. It's like a storm on the horizon, threatening to wreak havoc if action isn't taken. The urgency here is real, palpable. It's not just lawyers waving legal papers and shouting, it's a race against time. You see, this ban comes with strings attached, and one of those strings is this deadline. Second Amendment protects firearms in common use at the time and also said this, quote, for lawful purposes like self-defense. But at the crux of this is a bureaucrat making a unilateral decision to try to turn millions of Americans into felons. The Second Amendment from the day it was passed limited the type of people who could own a gun and what type of weapon you could own. If rifles and mags aren't registered by that date, it's like they become these ticking time explosives, subject to potential penalties or limitations. That's why the folks behind this legal ruckus are waving the emergency flag. They're saying, hey, Supreme Court, we need your attention now because this isn't some far-off problem, this is urgent, and we need immediate action. This impending deadline is like a fire alarm ringing loudly in the legal corridors, making everyone aware of the urgency. It's prompting this sense of, we can't afford to wait until the last minute. There's this pressing need for relief before that clock strikes January 1st. Think of it as a race to beat the buzzer in a basketball game. The players are pushing hard, making swift moves because they know time's running out. Here, the urgency isn't just about winning a game, it's about ensuring that rights are inadvertently forfeited or restricted when that deadline hits. And this urgency isn't just a legal tactic, it's a reflection of the real-life impact. 
Individuals, communities, everyone affected by this ban might find themselves in a bind if relief isn't granted before that deadline. It's the difference between having rights protected or facing potential consequences because of a missed deadline. So this impending registration deadline isn't just a date on the calendar, it's a catalyst for the urgent calls for action in the legal realm. It's pushing everyone involved to plead their case with fervor, hoping that the courts will recognize the time-sensitive nature of the situation and provide the needed relief before that crucial deadline comes crashing down. Request for Halting Laws Enforcement Let's zone in on the main aim behind this emergency injunction request. It's like hitting the pause button on the enforcement of this controversial law until everything gets a fair shake in the legal ring. You've got this law, this rifle and mag ban, and it's causing quite the stir. Now the folks challenging this law aren't just throwing legal jargon around for fun, they're asking for something big. They're saying, hold off on enforcing this law for a bit until we sort things out properly in court. Defund the police and then they want to take our Second Amendment right to defend ourselves. Change a law, they are already used to breaking the law and the people will still do it will continue to do it. Weapons and high-capacity magazines in three communities and three different states in our nation. Enough! It's like hitting the brakes on this law's enforcement, but not forever, just until the courts can dive into the nitty-gritty of the case. They're asking for a breather, a temporary timeout, so that while this legal battle rages on, the law doesn't come down like a hammer on those affected by it. The goal here isn't to obliterate the law altogether, at least not yet. It's about giving everyone involved, plaintiffs, defendants, judges, a chance to take a step back and thoroughly examine what's at stake. It's like saying, hey, let's not rush into this. Let's hit pause and make sure we've got all our facts and arguments lined up properly before the law starts taking its toll. This request for halting the law's enforcement isn't just a legal formality. It's a crucial step in ensuring fairness and justice. It's about making sure that while this legal tango unfolds, people's rights aren't inadvertently trampled upon because the law's wheels are already in motion. Think of it as a pit stop in a race. The cars don't stop forever, they just pause momentarily to tweak and fine-tune things before zooming off again. Similarly, this injunction request isn't about ending the race, it's about making sure everyone's on the same playing field before the race continues. So the primary goal here is simple yet significant. Hit that pause button on enforcing the law temporarily giving everyone a chance to catch their breath and ensure that when the legal dust settles, it does so with fairness and thoroughness in mind. It's about ensuring that the law doesn't come crashing down until everyone's had their fair shot at making their case in court. Second Amendment Implications in the Balance Buckle up because we're stepping into the big league, the Second Amendment territory. This rifle and mag ban case isn't just about here and now, it's sending shockwaves through the realm of Second Amendment rights. The Second Amendment, that gem of American rights, is like a big umbrella protecting the right to bear arms. And this legal showdown isn't just about a specific ban, it's about the shadows it casts on that very right. It's like a domino effect. A ruling here could set a precedent that echoes far beyond this specific case. Americans have the fundamental right to keep and bear arms that shall not be infringed. That you said that all assault weapons should be banned. Is that, a, is that a fair statement? Guns don't kill people. People kill people. Criminals, miscreants, will always get their hands on guns. What's at stake isn't just rifles and mags. It's the fundamental rights and freedoms that people believe are protected by the Second Amendment. This case is a key player in the ongoing debate over the extent of those rights and where the line gets drawn between regulation and individual liberties. The implications here reach far and wide. A decision made in this courtroom doesn't just affect the parties involved, it has the potential to ripple across the entire landscape of gun rights and regulations. It's like saying, what happens here doesn't just stay here. It's not just about this ban, it's about how courts interpret and apply the Second Amendment in the broader context of gun laws. The ruling could set a precedent for how other states, maybe even the entire country, approach similar issues involving firearms. This case is a snapshot of a much larger conversation, one that's been ongoing about the balance between gun rights and public safety. And whatever decision is handed down could influence future cases, debates, and even legislation 
related to Second Amendment rights. So while this legal showdown might seem like a battle over a specific ban, it's really a heavyweight bout in the ongoing saga of constitutional rights. It's about the broader implications, the echoes that this ruling could send throughout the legal landscape concerning the cherished Second Amendment. Whatever the outcome, it's bound to make waves that resonate far beyond the confines of this particular lawsuit. That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.